What's up, everybody? Welcome to the SAT live stream, live stream review. So welcome, everybody. And today we are gearing up for the five-day review, preparing you for the SAT this Saturday. I'm very excited because and this is... Today hold on, sorry. Let me shut this off here. I'm very excited because this is the first time I've ever scheduled a live stream and I've set up a plan like this to really give people a crash course, mm -hmm. a, um, a hard-hitting uh, five-day kind of like cram session to prepare for the SAT. I think it's going to be really effective. I'm, I'm really excited to do this. Uh, this is going to be like my other videos where I'm actually going to do a live walkthrough of a SAT practice test in real time. I'm going straight to the source, the Khan Academy, and I'm stepping through test one through five in the next five days uh, for the calculator and non-calculator section. Uh, that's it, just the math portions. The idea is that you can watch me and sort of pick up through, by, by watching what I do, pick up the my methods and the way I approach the different problems. Also, you can learn the math that maybe fill in gaps that, that are there right now and really help everything click in this last week. Look. The main, my main philosophy when it comes to teaching math for the SAT or ACT or any standardized test is I want to actually teach you the math. As much as test prep companies try to market based on tips and tricks and how to outthink the test makers and all this stuff, I mean, I just think that's such overblown marketing nonsense. Yes, there are certain strategies and little time-saving tips here and there that we can definitely employ to give yourself the best chance at, a, at the highest score possible. But really, at the end of the day, I want to teach you the math because that's what you it's, it's a math test. You've got to know the math and you got to know the basics in order to be able to answer these questions. And you can do it. It's not like... This is some insanely crazy math that you've never seen before. If you're in high school, you've seen the math, you understand, you've, you've probably done it, you've probably understood it very well at one point. So now it's just a matter of really getting your mind prepared and reactivated and ready to rock when it comes time to take the SAT. So without further ado, let's jump into practice test one. Now I got it all geared up. And for those of you who like uh, to watch my live streams, you'll probably know that a lot of times I, I am taking things cold, meaning when I come on camera and I'm, I'm solving the problems on camera, I've never seen the problems before. And that's, I think that makes it as realistic as possible because they the because Khan Academy only has eight practice tests and I've taken all of them I'm going to be doing these for a second time or maybe even a third time at this point so that's just my caveat there uh, it's been a while since I've seen it so it's going to be kind of new to me anyways I'm going to step through and provide explanations on the fly as I go hopefully you find this super useful and the great thing is I planned this live stream out so hopefully we have a good showing today and what you guys can do is on the breaks in between the time where I'm taking the you know in between the break from the calculator to the no calculator section, uh, you guys can ask uh, ask me questions and hopefully I can answer them and then I'll get back to business. So without further ado, let's do it. Here we go. This is the no calculator section, 25 minutes, 20 questions total. Let's do it. All right, X minus three x minus one over three equals k, and k equals three, so I'm gonna sub k in right there. What's the value of x? Multiply both sides by three, we get x minus one equals nine. Add one, and we get x equals 10. Boom. Next. Uh, I is the square root of negative one imaginary number. What is the sum of this? So first of all, I'm gonna get rid of those parentheses because they're not doing anything. And we're going to combine like terms, treat it just like as if it were a variable. Okay, so seven adds to negative eight goes to negative one. Oops. And then three I plus nine I is 12 I. On Saturday, Armand sent M text messages each hour for five hours. So he sent five hours times M. So every hour he's sending M text messages, did it for five hours, so it's five M. Tyrone sends P text messages for each hour, every four hours, so he's four P, which is the following represents the total text messages. It's just the sum of these two, five M plus four P. They're not like terms, so we can't combine it and make it nine M P. It's just stay separate. Let me make sure I did that correctly, five M, yeah, cool. Kathy is a repair technician for a phone company. Each week she receives a batch of phones that needs, need repairs. The number of phones that she has left to fix at the end of the day can be estimated with that equation where P is the number of phones left, D is the number of days she worked. Okay, this is 
And what is the meaning of 108? Look, this is the constant. As always, your constant is your starting point or your y-intercept. And the, at zero days, what this seems to imply is that she's starting off with 108 phones. Day one, she gets done 23. Day two, she's repaired 46. But it's this equation is means that she starts each week with 108 phones to fix. All right, next. So the following is equivalent to the expression above. We got to simplify here, so I'm going to write we got to match up our like terms plus 5xy squared. I'm going to distribute the negative in one term. So the negative jumps to those, those, those. So it becomes a positive x squared y minus 3xy squared plus 3y squared. You see I'm flipping the sign of each of these, right? So these two are like terms. And these are like terms here. And these are like terms. Notice this is a negative 3y squared, positive 3y squared. They cancel out. This goes to 2x squared y. This goes to, it's like 5 minus 3, which is 2, plus 2xy squared. And that should be it. 2x squared y plus 2xy squared, so this guy. OK, next. Pediatrician uses this model to estimate the height of a boy <clears throat> in terms of the boy's age in years between two and five. Based on the model, what's the estimated increase in inches of the boy's height each year? Look, this is the year value, right? So every time it goes up by, that's basically my slope is the value in front of that variable, which is three. And so it's going up by three. And you can quickly see that if you plug in two, you get 31.6. You plug in, th uh, I'm sorry, one, you get 31.6. Two, you get 34.6. Three, you get 37.6. So it's going up by three right there every time. Oh, shoot, I missed it. There we go. The formula above gives a monthly payment M needed to pay off a loan of P dollar. This is at a recent annual in interest over N months, which is the following gives P. OK, all of this doesn't even matter. They just want P in terms of M, R, and N. So we need to isolate P. So watch what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say we've got all this. So don't do this on the test and recopy down the original equation. I just have to do this so you can see it. So big waste of time over 1 plus r over 1,200 to the n minus 1 times p. So first of all, I'm going to multiply the entire left side by this denominator and just get it over there. So then it's m times um, 1 plus r over 1,200 to the n, oops, to the n power minus one. And then uh, since this is multiplying the p and I want to isolate it, we're going to divide both sides by this numerator. So then this kind it's kind of like it flips positions, right? And then this goes on the bottom. One plus r over 1200 to the n. And this all equals p. So there's my answer. Oh, let me undo that. It looks a little messy, but there's my answer. And now let's see what we got here. It's a little reformatted, but I can tell that we need, hold on, r over 1,200. So this can't be it, because th remember, this is supposed to be in the denominator. Um, Let's see, it's probably this one, r over 1,200. Yeah, this looks right. And then the m is out here versus my m is there. It's the same thing. Uh, yeah, it's this guy. All right. If a over b equals 2, what is the value of 4b over a? All right. So what I can do here, let's see, 4b over a. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to watch this. So I'm going to say a, b equals 2. I'm going to get b over a. Okay, this is how I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply both sides by b. I get a equals 2b. Then I'm going to divide both sides by a. I get b over a. Actually, this is perfect. b over a equals 2, 2b over a equals 1. OK, so this is actually pretty good. And then if I double this, if I multiply both sides by 2, guess what? I get 4b over a equals 2. And that's it. Right? Did I do that correctly? Hold on. Let me think about this for a second. No, I made a mistake. I made it. No, wait, wait, wait. I think it's right. Because b over a would equal 1 half. And then 4b over a should equal 2. So I think that's right. All right, let's keep going. 
What is the solution of the system of equations above? 3x plus 4y equals negative 23. And then we got 2y minus x equals negative 19. So I'm going to flip these guys and I'm going to use, uh, uh, what's it called? I'm going to combine these. So let's see, sorry, let me flip it, sorry. Negative x plus 2y. So I'm lining up the x's and the y's. Then I'm gonna multiply this bottom one by three because I can see that I can match up the x's. So it becomes negative 3x plus 6y equals negative 57. Okay, let me remove this. And now I'm gonna add these together. And so these cancel out. Then I got 10y equals negative 80. Divide by 10, y equals negative eight. So anything with a negative eight, it's gotta be this one, negative eight, three. I'll just test that. If I plug in negative eight here, I get negative 32 plus nine is negative 23, so it's right. Next, we've got a x squared plus 24. For the function, a is constant and g of four equals eight. So we need to find g of negative four. So first I need to figure out what a is and this provides the answer. So g of four is eight, so eight equals a when x is four, so I'm plugging in four for x, eight for the function value, plus 24. So then I've got eight, plus, uh, eight equals 16a plus 24 minus 24 minus 24, and we get negative 16 equals 16a. Divide by 16, divide by 16, a equals negative one. So now I'm gonna plug this back in here negative one, and we want g of negative four. So this becomes negative. Uh, it's still 60, so this still becomes, let me move all this. Uh, this becomes uh, equals positive 16 times negative one, because negative four squared is positive 16 times negative one, negative 16 plus 24 is eight. So it's also eight. Um, which actually makes sense. I didn't even need to find a because it was squared. So it actually the negative or positive four should give the same result. I should have known that. All right, b equals 2.35 this and c equals this. And the equations above b and c represent the price per pound in dollars of beef and chicken respectively x weeks after July 1st, okay. So it's like if x is one, it's one week after July 1st, x is two, two weeks. What was the price per pound of beef when the price per pound of beef was equal? So when, basically I'm trying to find the price uh, when they're equal. So I'm gonna just set these guys equal to each other. 0.25x equals 1.75 plus 0.4x. So we're trying to find, uh, not necessarily the value of x, we're gonna find the value of x and we have to plug it back in, actually to either equation because the two are equal and then we're gonna get that price um, of the beef. So let's go ahead and bring the x's together. So that's gonna be 2.35 equals 1.75 plus 0.4 minus 0.25 is 0.15x. I mean, you can kind of see right on the no calculator how important it is to be fast with mental math. I mean, it makes a big difference. Okay, so then this becomes, here, let's just do it. I think it's 0.6, but let's just be safe. 13, yeah, it's seven. So it's 0.6 equals 0.15x, and then divide both sides by 0.15x x equals four, but that's not the answer, right? Even if they might have four, they don't. Okay, so that's nice of them. Now we're gonna plug it into the price of beef. So it's 2.35 plus 0.25 times four. Four times 0.25 is one. So it's just 3.35. And the other thing is too, notice on this no calculator section, all the numbers are nice and neat. You know, and we're getting nice whole numbers. So that's another thing to look for. If you're getting like crazy numbers on the no calculator section, that's a red flag. A line in the XY plane passes through the origin, passes through the origin means it has the point zero zero and has a slope of one seventh, which of the following points lies on the line, okay. So let's see here. Um, I'm gonna say Y, let's just come up with the equation using point slope, y minus zero equals one seventh times x minus zero, so it's y equals one seventh x, pretty straightforward. And uh, so now for all, we just gotta plug and chug and see which one set of these points fits in this equation. If I plug seven in for y and zero in for x, that'll be seven equals zero, no. So a is out, b is 
x is 1. No, that won't work. That'll say 1 7th equals 7. C is, that'll be 7 equals 1. It's got to be D, uh, but let's make sure why. I'm basically plugging in four, 14 here, and I'm plugging in 2 here. 1 7th of 14 is 2, so it works. We know it's right. All right, which of the following is equivalent to this? All right, I already know. Look, here's the deal. A lot of infinite things can be equivalent to this, but what they usually want you to do in this case is simplify. That's what they're asking you to do. And in terms of simplifying, we want to kind of combine this and just, just consolidate everything. So the first step is how do we combine these two? Well, I need a common, you can't just flip it and the common mistake is flip it right now. You can't flip it until these are consolidated. So we're gonna have a common denominator of x plus three times x plus two, right? And up here, we've got x plus two as well. I have to multiply top and bottom by x plus two, top and bottom by x plus three. Otherwise, we're changing the fraction fundamentally. And then we this becomes, then now I can combine these bot on the bottom becomes x plus three plus x plus two over, oops over x plus 3, x plus 2, and then this whole thing is 1 is over that. Now, we're divi 1 is dividing that, so then it flips to become x plus 3 times x plus 2 over 2x plus 5, right? x plus x, 2x, 3 plus 2 is 5. So let's see. Uh, it's this one. All they did was they just foiled this, and I, but it has to be. This is the only one with 2x plus 5 in the denominator, so we're good there. Okay, next we've got 3x minus y equals 12. What is the value of that? Well, guess what? I'm just going to I'm gonna take this, and I'm going to... We need this. I, what is the value? Well, I need y in terms of x, right? So I'm going to add y to both sides. And then I'm going to subtract 12. So y equals 3x minus 12. Now I'm going to plug that in. So I'm going to be like 8 to the x over 2 to the 3x minus 12. In order to combine these exponents, we need the same base. This right now is an 8, but it can be written as 2 cubed. So I could write it as 2 cubed to the x and then distribute that in. It becomes, you know, because that's how you multiply those exponents like that. So it becomes 2 to the 3x. See, now this makes a little more sense. Now we can combine by subtracting the exponents when through division. So it becomes 2 to the 3x minus 3x minus 12. Distribute the negative and we get 2 to the 3x minus 3x plus 12. These cancel out, so it's 2 to the 12th. Strangely. This is a one that could trick you, trip you up, right? But uh, it's, it's that. Okay, question 15, and then in question 16, it's gonna get easier because we're going to a new section. ax plus two times bx plus seven equals this. And for all values of x, a plus b equals eight, what are the two possible values for c? Here's what I'm gonna do right off the bat. I see this, a, a good rule of thumb is when you see stuff like this and you're not really sure what to do, just FOIL. And that's what I'm gonna start with. So I'm gonna get, multiply those two first terms and get a, b, x squared plus seven a x plus two b x plus 14 okay equals and then on the other side we have 15 x squared plus c x plus 14. now this is really helpful because check it out this term is matched up with this term which means that a b equals 15. right off the bat i've gotten a nice equation i also know that a plus b equals eight with this system of equations, I can now actually solve for these guys. Oh, I have another equivalency, right? Look at this. 7a plus 2b times x. Look, I can factor the, this x out from these two. And now I know that 7a plus 2b equals c. Okay, and we're trying to find c here. So what are, what are the two values? Well, I can tell you, look, I don't even have to do the substitution or anything. I can see right here, <laughs> A and B, the only two numbers that add up to 8 and multiply 15 are 3 and 5. So A can be 3, B can be 5, uh, or vice versa. And so the two values, if A is 5 and B is 3, 35 plus 6 is 41. Or the other way around is this is A. So it's 21 plus 10 is 31. So 41 and 31. Now we'll get a nice reset. So time-wise, I'm doing I'm doing okay. Not great, but I'm doing okay. T squared minus four, what is the value of T? Simple, two. It's gotta be, right? 
Uh, it could also be negative two, but they're specifying it's greater than zero. So two squared is four, four minus four equals zero, done. See, it's nice, right? 16 is usually pretty easy. <clears throat> We've got this nice two triangles. They're definitely similar because of that, the way they're drawn like that. With these angles are equal and these two angles are also equal because they're vertical angles. So they want to find the, here, let me move this drawing here so I can see it simultaneously. Uh, where is it? Um, screenshot, here we go. All right, summer camp counselor wants to find the length X in feet across a lake and the lengths represented by AB, blah, 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 blah. So it's saying AB is, it's giving it in the same order, 1800. Uh, EB is 1400, right? Um, BD is 700, right? And CD is 800, CD is 800. The segments AC and DE intersect and these have the same measure, what is the value of x? Look, these you have to just know that these are similar triangles because of these two angles are equal, these two angles are equal. Therefore, there's a proportionate relationship across the, the sides. And look, since these two angles are equal, uh, it also means that we now have to assume that these angles are equal too. So guess what? Since the equal angles, uh, the, the sides opposite these equal angles must be proportionate. So I can right away see that there is a one to two relationship here, right? You multiply this by two and you get it, the relative side here. So guess what? I already know this side has to be related to this because these two equal angles, you know, reflect that one and that one. So this is just double 800, which is 1600. You see, this is 18, this mu one must be 900, but we're not, they're not asking that. So value of X is 1600. Seven minutes left, another system of equations, nice. All right, I'm looking at this one and I'm like, this is perfect for uh, co uh, combining, okay? Meaning I'm just gonna add them together. But first I, I need to knock, I wanna knock the uh, Y out actually. I could knock the X out, but we're solving for X, so it's easier, it'll be faster if we knock the Y out. So I'm gonna multiply the entire top one by negative two. And I get negative two X minus two Y equals 18. I'm doing this negative 2 times negative 9 is 18. I'm doing this so these guys instantly cancel out when I combine these in the linear combinations. x plus negative 2x is negative x. Negative 25 plus 18 equals negative 7. Divide both sides by negative 1. x equals positive 7. And we can just check that. If x is 7, y is negative 16, 7, negative 16, negative 32. And yeah, and it works for both. A right triangle. Do, do, do. What am I doing? I see the word right triangle. They didn't draw one for me. I'm drawing my own. In a right triangle, one angle measure one angle measures x, okay? Where sine of x equals 4 over 5. Well, guess what? I'm just going to use my Ahsoka Toa, right? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. It means the opposite side must be 4 and the Hypotenuse must be five. I mean, actually not, doesn't have to be. It could, it's just a ratio of four to five, but I can pick those values. I mean, that's totally fine. Uh, this is also a right triangle. So I know that I, I, this has to be a three, four, five because using Pythagorean's theorem, three squared plus four squared, that's the only thing that satisfies it. We know it's a right triangle. So now I figured out what this triangle is. Now it's asking what is cosine of 90 minus X? What is 90 minus X? That's this angle right here. Why? because these two angles have to add up to be 90, because this one's 90, therefore these two have to add up to 90, so all three add up to 180. Uh, so 90 minus x is just this. What is cos, there's a theorem that we can take a shortcut, but this is just as good. What is the cosine of this angle? Cosine is adjacent, which is the four, over hypotenuse, which is five. Uh, the theorem is that sine of one angle of a right triangle is equal to the cosine of the other one, but if you don't know that, it's fine, you can just do it this way. Uh, four fifths. All right, I'm a big fan of not having to memorize when possible because if your memory fails or you you misplace you know you misremember a formula just by the little littlest bit, you're thrown up. Okay, so now we have a equals five square root two. Two a equals square root of two x. What is the value of x? Okay, well I'm gonna sub in this for a. 
right? This is really a system of equations. So it's 2 times 5 square root 2 equals square root of 2x. Remember, this entire thing is under the square root. So this is 10 square root 2 equals square root of 2x. I want x, so I'm going to do. I'm going to get it out of this square root symbol. So I'm going to square both sides. So that like liberates it. And this just becomes 2x equals. And then square this becomes 100. Square root of 2 squared is 2. So this becomes 200 equals 2x. Divide both sides by 2. And x equals 100. OK. Sweet. Um, I think we're good. Let's just quickly see if there's any ones with the extra time that I didn't fill out or something. I know that was good. That was good. That was good. This one I was good. That one was definitely good. Yeah, 335. I think that was good. Yep. You know, if I, if I was really taking this test, I would be going over these more thoroughly. I'm just doing quick mental checks. Like here, I'd plug in 3, 9 plus negative 24. I'm sorry. 9 plus negative 32, excuse me, is negative 23. Uh, negative 16, right? Negative 16 minus 3 is negative 19. So that's a good check right there. This one I'm pretty confident about. Let's double check, though. That flips to the top. And then that flips to the bottom. Yeah, it's got to be right. OK. This one I'm pretty confident about. Let's just double check here. 2x squared y, that's got to be right. Negative 3 positive, so no y term. And then 5x squared minus that is 2x. Yeah, that's got to be right. This one was good. Starts each week. Yep, uh, 5m, m for 5 hours, 5m, 4p, negative 1, negative 1 plus 12i. And we said x is 10 minus 1 is 9 divided by 3 is 3. Yeah. OK, so that's it. That was my quick check. And let's finish the section. What? Go back to question one. Yeah, OK. That's cool. I think I'm done. So wait, let's review. Boom, they're all correct. So if I do, you know, it's bound to happen in the next five days that I'll probably make a mistake here or there. So when I do, I'm going to go over those questions and we'll look at what went wrong. If I misread something or if I made a miscalculation, whatever it may be. Let me just quickly look and see if we got any questions here. OK, so we say, first of all, were you expecting to get the score you received? What were your thought process while test taking? Uh, well, when I took it as an adult, I mean, yeah, I got I got a hundred. I got a 800 on the math. And it was what I was expecting because I, you know, this is like my life now is I teach math all the time. And my thought, I mean, it's very different for me now. When I was in high school, gosh, I mean, I just prepped as hard as I could. I took as many. I didn't get a perfect. I got a 770 in high school, but I took as many practice tests as I could. And I just tried to familiarize myself with the format and the style, the test question style so that I wasn't thrown for a loop. Uh, what I found now today is because I, it, my, I've practiced so much more. I mean, you know, for years and I've just practiced over and over. I'm really just not, there's very low chance that I'll ever be intimidated by a question. Like I immediately have an image in my mind when I see something of roughly how I can, how I can solve it. Okay. So do you have any tips that would help me prep for my SAT this weekend? That's what this is all about. So what I want you to do is I want you to watch me take the SAT, uh, take these SAT math sections and hopefully pick up the ways that I'm solving the problem so you can maybe add some speed or some accuracy when you're going about and solving the solving the problems yourself. On Friday, I'm going to go over a bunch of tips, like just kind of short general things that you're going to want to do when whenever you're on the SAT, especially when you're stuck or you're not sure. Like some of those are you should draw everything out, especially when we're talking about figures. Like you saw me draw that triangle out as a huge help. Another thing is whenever you see we're talking dealing with quadratics and parentheses, you want to instinctively 
foil if you see parentheses in a problem and you're stuck or alternatively factor if you if you see a quadratic and you're just not sure where to go and that will really help you a lot all right so madison you said for question 12 would there be another way to solve it not using plug and chug let me see number 12. um hold on oh no not really because it's like once you have the solution, you see even here in their answers, like they're plugging it in to show that it works. And th the problem is, is that with this linear equation that I created, when I created the equation, it was, it was y equals 1 7th x. And there's infinite coordinates that work. And so you kind of have to go through and actively disqualify the coordinates that are incorrect that basically just don't match up. So unfortunately, in this type of a problem, plug and chug is the only way to go. All right, guys. So I hope that was helpful. Now we get into the calculator section. This is going to be a longer section. So let's take a look. We finished this. And boom, so it's 38 questions, 55 minutes. I'll make sure to get my calculator all set to go here. Ready, see it, and begin. John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows target heart rate at different times during his workout, which interval target heart rate strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing. Uh, it would be something like boom and then boom. So it's probably here and yeah, 40, 60. Cause see here, it's like not strictly, it's kind of like staying steady. So we want something where it's just straight positive slope, then negative slope. Um, 50 to 65 is, wait, let me make sure. Yeah, strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing. So 40 to 60. Next, uh, y equals kx, where k is a constant, and y equals 24 when x equals 6. So y equals 24. I'm just plugging it into that equation. When x equals 6, k equals 4, therefore. Uh, so now I've got a new equation, y equals 4x. What is the value of y when x equals 5? Plug it in here and you see y equals 20. Next, the figure to the left, lines L and M are parallel and lines S and T are parallel. If the measure of line 1 is 35, what is angle? Oh, sorry, 1 is 35, what is angle 2? I'll show you over here how we can do this. But this is just knowing about parallel lines and these different angles. Okay, so it says that line angle one is 35. Uh, this one is also 35, it's a corresponding angle. This is a transversal. Uh, and this one is also 35, and therefore these are on one line so that they add up to 180. So 180 minus 35 is 145 degrees. So that's what angle two is. And it looks right, like all of these are smaller than 90. That's clearly bigger than 90. And you can't always go based on the drawing, but I'm pretty confident uh, with that drawing in addition to the math. Okay, 16 plus four is 16 plus four X is, I'm turning this into equation, is 10 more than 14. What is the value of 8x? The watch I'm going to do, I'm going to add these. I'm going to use a little shortcut here. I'm not going to solve for x completely. I'm going to solve for 4x. You know why? Because this then gives me 8. And then I can double both sides and I get 8x, which is what we're solving for, equals 16. Which of the following graphs best show a strong negative association? Negative association is a negative slope. That's it. Uh, that is no association. That is not a negative. That's positive. Here's negative. Boom. Done. One decagram. Okay. Hospital stores one type of medicine in two decagram containers. Okay. Two decagram containers. How many one milligram doses are there in one two decagram containers? So a decagram. So two decagrams is 20 grams, right? And according to this, one gram is a thousand, so 20 grams is 20,000 milligrams. So how many one milligram doses are there in a two decagram container? That makes sense, it's big. I think that's right on, this is just throwing me for a loop for a second, I wanna make sure I'm doing this right. One dec So two decagrams is 20 grams, and then 20 grams, 
So I multiply both sides by 20, I get 20 grams equals 20,000. It's gotta be right. It just seems big, but I think it's correct. Next. The number of rooftops with solar panel installation five stages shown to the left. The total number of installations is 27,500. What is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? Okay, vertical axis. And we're talking total number is 27,500. Oh, I see. It's in tens, hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands. It's probably in thousands because all of these should add. Okay, so it's like, look, 9 plus 5 is 14, plus 6 is 20, 24. 27.5 so that if it's 27.5 it means these should all be in the thousands because then it'd be 27,500 it's got to be this one right otherwise if it's in the tens of thousands this alone would be 90,000 right so it doesn't make any sense so do it right in the yeah next for what value of n is n minus 1 plus 1 equal to 0 Okay, I can already tell there's no solution. You know why? If we isolate this, this is now asking something in absolute value bars to equal a negative. This is impossible. Everything that comes out of this will be positive, so there's no such value uh, for n. Okay, the speed of sound in air depends on the air temperature. The formula shows the ratio between A, speed of sound, and, and T, the temperature. Got it. Done. Um, in degrees. Okay. Which of the following expresses air temperature in terms of, oh, okay, good. Look, this is a great example of a question where all they're doing is something in terms of something else. They're just isolating T. That's it. So you don't even really need to read anything else. So I'd subtract 1,052 from both sides and then divide by 1.08. And so it's A minus one. It's this one. See, that's wrong. It's not plus. It's not any of this. The next question at which of the following air temperatures will the speed of a sound wave be closest to a thousand feet per second? So A is the speed, so that's a thousand. Remember this is calculator section. So I'm gonna plug in a thousand for A equals 1052 plus 1.08 T. Subtract 1052 from both sides and we get negative 52 equals 1.08 T. Divide by 1.08, okay. Negative 52 divided by 1.08 equals negative 48, roughly. Okay. Next, which of the following is not a solution to this inequality? Well, let's isolate x, right? So 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4x minus 3. Subtract 3x from both sides. And I'm going to simultaneously add 3 to both sides, just save a step. And that's x is less than or equal to negative 2. Let's rewrite it this way. So anything, so x is less than or equal to negative 2. So anything greater than negative 2 is no good, which is 1, right? This is part of it. This is part of it. And th these are all solutions. Those all satisfy this inequality. Uh, number of seeds in each of 12 apples. Based on the histogram shown of the following, which is closest to the average number of seeds per apple? Uh, okay, so this means we have two at three seeds, um, four at five seeds, one, six, two, seven. So you see how I'm transmute, like I'm turning this into numbers, and then three nines, okay? So we're gonna add these all up and divide by 12 and we'll get the mean. So it's 6 plus 26, uh, 32, 42, 46, 46 plus 27. I could use a calculator, but I think this is faster. And then it's 73, divided. it's got to be 6, because seventy. it's like 72, but 73 divided by 12 is about 6. So cool. See, sometimes it's faster not to use a calculator, and that's why mental math I think is so important. Next, a group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data was broken down in the table to the left. Which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents? So 19%, let's use our percent proportion. So x out of 310 equals 19 over 100. Cross multiply x times 100 equals 310 times 19. 310 is 19 equals 5890.
divide by 100, divide by 100. And this just is like 58.9, move the decimal over. So which one is around 59? And I can see male geometry right there, simple. All right, once we do that math, just identify the number. Next, the table lists the length to the nearest inch of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Of the mean median range, which will change the most if the 24 is removed? Uh, straight up, it's the range. You know why? Nothing is going to drop by this much. The range is going to drop from 16 to 8. That's massive. Like, even the next one down might be the mean. The mean might shift, but it'll shift by, like, a really small amount, maybe by, like, 1 or something. So it, that range is going to take the biggest hit anytime you cut out a uh, an outlier like that. Next. What does the C intercept represent in the graph? It's the the graph also says total cost of renting a boat for eight hours. It it's like the it, it's got to be how much you just have to pay up front just to get the boat. So the initial cost of renting the boat. That's always what the intercept value is. And now we've got this one. Which of the following represents the relationship between H and C? Uh, it's, it's we need a y intercept of five, so A and D are gone. And then what's the slope? We're going up one, two, three over one. One, two, so it's three. So it's this one, slope of three. Just make sure that's right. Yeah, okay. It's tricky because if you don't read this carefully, you might be like, goes up one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Like you're tempted to pick three fourths as a slope, but it's three. The, the complete graph of f is shown in the xy plane. For what value of x is f of x at its minimum? Well, here's the minimum. The minimum of the function is where it's at its lowest point, and it looks to be like x is 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And I know that because it's all by, this tells you it's by 1, so this is negative 3. In the xy plane, 0, 0 is a solution to the system of inequalities. Which of the following relations between a and b must be true? Let's plug in those 0, 0. So it's 0 is less than... 0 plus a, which is just a, and the other one gives 0 is greater than b, or b is, uh, okay, here we go. b is, this is really nice, b is less than 0, a is greater than 0, b is negative, a is positive, um, which means, yes, a has to be bigger than b. a is positive, b is negative. This has to be true. This one is patently false. Um, this one we don't know. We just know that there, because once we take the absolute value, this could be like a could be one, b could be negative ten. So this isn't necessarily true. This is we have no idea if that's true. So yeah, a is good to go. A food truck sells salads for six fifty, um, six fifty, and each drink. I already can tell this is going to be something like this. And the food truck revenue is from selling two hundred. This is a system of equations: two hundred nine salads and drinks is this okay so check it out we don't know how they didn't tell us how many salads or drinks we have two relationships okay we have salads plus drinks equals 209 and then we know that the number of this times 650 plus the number of this times two dollars equals 836.5 okay now we have a system of equations and let's solve we want to know how many salads so guess what i'm going to isolate d and I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna plug it in over here for D and I'm gonna solve and I'm gonna get my S. So it's 6.5 S, I'm just putting this in the front, um, plus 209 minus S times two, equals 836.5. Distribute the two, 6.5 S plus 418 minus two S Combine these, that becomes 4.5s plus 418 equals 836.5. Subtract 418 from both sides. And we get, I think this is 418.5. I would encourage you to use your calculator to double check, but I'm pretty confident. Uh, and then I've got to divide both sides by 4.5. I'm at the very bottom here. So now I'm going to use a calculator, 418.5. 418.5 divided by 4.5. 93. Dunzos. All right, next. 
Alma bought a laptop. Now look, I'm doing really good time-wise because I've still got 42 minutes left. I'm, I'm already halfway through. I'm gonna start to slow down now because 20 through 30 are tough. But then again, it's gonna reset in 30 through like 34 are gonna be easy again. Alma bought a laptop at a computer store. I gave 20% discount off its original price, which means she's actually paying 80%. The total amount she paid to the cashier was P dollars. P dollars is my total including an 8% sales tax on the, so this is 0.8 times the original price. So I'll call it like, uh, oh, okay. So 0.8 times O is what she paid. But then she also paid 8% sales tax on top of this, uh, from this price. So I'm multiplying this price times 1.08. Um, which of the following represents the original price, meaning isolate this in terms of P. So I'm just gonna isolate, I'm gonna divide both sides by 0 0.8 times 1.08, 0 0.8 times 1.08. And it's this P over this one. You might ask, why did I use 0 0.8 and not 0 0.2? Because if I'm getting a 20% discount, I'm actually only paying 80%. And, and so that's the one number that we want, not the 0 0.2. Dreams we call during one week. Uh, the day in the table was produced by a sleep researcher. A number of dreams. People were called and asked to record their dreams. Group X consisted of 100 people, right? And Y consists of 100 who observed later bedtimes. So they went early, late. If a person is chosen at random from those who recalled at least one dream, so it's this group and this group, what is the probability that the person belonged to group Y? Okay, so at least one dream is 39 plus 125. It is 164 is the total. And what is the probability that they belong to group Y? 11 plus 68 is 79. So it's 79 out of 164, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Annual budget for different programs in Kansas. Which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture slash national resources from 2008 to 2010? Um, I'm just going to estimate 488,000 minus 358 is 130. So 130,000. But remember, this is given in thousands of dollars. So we add on three more zeros, and that's it. Uh, oh, no, but that's over two years. So we divide it by two. And this is per year, 65 million. Next, the following, which program's ratio of its 2007 to 2010 is close to human resources ratio, 2007 to 2010. So human resources is here. It's about like four to six, roughly, four million to six million, which is two thirds, okay? So which one is also two thirds? This is like 26 to 46, or like, this is like 2.5 to 4.5. That's definitely not two thirds for, I'm looking at public safety. This one is 1.5. That seems too high. That's like 1.5 to 1.8. I don't know. Let me come back to that. Uh, this one's like almost equivalent. That's not it. This one looks like two thirds about, right? This is probably it, right? Two, it's basically like two over three or 2.1 over three. So I'm gonna go with education. Um, I'll check this when I do, when I review, make sure those numbers are correct. I'm pretty sure that's right though. Next, which of the following is an equation of a circle? Okay, so we need a circle equation, X minus H. I got a song about this. X my, oh, I can't remember how it goes. <laughs> X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared equals goals are squared. So we have to know this equation. And that's why I wrote that song. So now it says, which of the following is an equation with center zero four. So my center is zero four. That's what H and K are. So it becomes X squared plus Y minus four squared equals with endpoint. So we need the radius now to, to flesh out this equation. Uh, why does it give us that radius? Why does it give us the endpoint? Well, guess what? The distance from the radius to the endpoint is going to give us the distance of our, our radius. So I can use my distance formula. 
which is square root of, take the difference of these two, 4 thirds minus 0 squared, so it's just 4 thirds squared, plus the difference of these two, which is 1 squared. So this is 16 ninths plus, I'll make that, that's 1, which is, I'll make it 9 over 9, which is 25 over 9. And therefore, the radius is 5 thirds. So plug in 5 thirds here. <clears throat> right, 5 thirds, and then we get x squared plus y minus 4 squared, and then equals 5 thirds squared, which is 25 over 9. Um, this is the circle equation right there. It's got to be one of these two. These got the radius wrong, and it's this guy. x squared plus y minus 4. Yeah, yeah. All right, next. H equals negative 4.9 T squared plus 25 T. The equation above expresses the approximate height H in meters of a ball T seconds after it's launched vertically upward from the ground with an initial velocity of 25 meters per second, which is shown right there. After approximately how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? Done. We're just meaning when is the height going to equal zero? And then we got to solve for this 4.9 T squared plus 25 T. I'm going to factor out t, negative 4.9, t plus 25. Okay, so there's two values that will send this to zero. One when t equals zero, but that's just the, that's not when it's going to hit the ground. That's the starting one. So because we're just now doing this, so now I can not worry about that because that is a value of zero. Now I can just say negative 4.9 t plus 25 equals zero and solve for t. Subtract 25 from both sides. 4.9 t equals negative 25, divide both sides by negative 4.9. It's approximately 5, I can already tell, right? Because it's like it's like dividing 25 by that, so it's like, we'll say roughly 5. I assume that answer is there. And uh, we can do the calculation quickly just to make sure, right? If, you're, if you want, divided by 4.9 to be like 5.1 or something. Yeah, see, 5.1. So 5 is the closest, and we're good there. Katerina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She knows how type A produced 20% more pears than type B. Okay, so A, I'm just going to immediately set up an equation to relate these. A produces 20% more. How do we represent 20% more? We multiply by 1.2. 20% more than type B. Boom. Those are equated. Uh, type If type A produced 140, you see how I just put it in an equation now how easy this is going to be? Uh, if type A produced 144, how many did type B produce? Divide both sides by 1.2. Uh, it's going to be, uh, let's see, 120, maybe 144 divided by 1 1.2 is 120. And so B equals 120. Now, double check, right? This is saying that B did... A produces more. So if A produces 144, B is at 120. That seems to make sense, so I'm good with that, logically. A square field measures, I'm immediately drawing the square. A square field measures 10 by 10. 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region of the field. Each region is a square and has a length of one meter. So it would be like one, one, you know, one, one, you know, like I'm just picking, so these little guys, uh, little squares, and there's 10 of these. <clears throat> the students count the earthworms contained in the soil to a depth of five centimeters beneath. Okay, so they're counting the earthworms. The results are shown. So they're getting one of. Okay, which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms beneath the ground surface in the entire field? Okay, so well, oh, these are spaced out so far. I don't have to do much. This is we can be very approximate. It looks like the mean or median value, whatever, is about 150 per one of these little plots. Okay. And there's there's a uh, hundred of these little squares because if each one is one by one, right? This has a total area of a hundred, so there's a hundred of them. So we could take that value, multiply it by a hundred, and we get uh, fifteen thousand. That's it. Okay, now these last two should be tough. Now, in the system of inequalities, y is greater than. Hold on. y is greater than or equal to 2x plus 1, and y is greater than 1 half x minus 1 is graphed. Which of the following quadrants contains no solution? This is not the prettiest graph, but I'm going to show you. Let's see if we can do this here. 1, this is negative 1. 
Let's see if I can get a decent graph here. So the first one is two. Y is greater than or equal to two x plus one. So just like we graph a linear equation, y-intercept is one, slope is two. So we go up two over one, and it says greater than or equal to. So we do a solid line, and we're shade. It says greater than or equal to. So the solution set contains everything above. The second one is one half x minus one. Y-intercept of negative one, slope of one half. So we go up one over two. And this is a dotted line, okay? And it's greater than, again, so I'm shading everything here. And of course, the solution set is the overlap, right? Uh, I can see an overlap in quadrant three. I can see an overlap in quadrant two, and I can see a little overlap up here in quadrant one. So it hits quadrant one, two, and three. But look, there's not going to be, because this function has no solutions in quadrant four. Therefore, quadrant four will contain no solutions. That's it. This makes it really tricky, right, when they have one of those that can throw you for a loop. But you draw it out, and you're good to go. OK, for a polynomial p of x, p of 3 is negative 2, which of the following must be true. OK, you just got to know this. And the fact of the matter is, is that if p of 3 were 0, that would mean it's a solution. That would mean that x minus 3 is a factor. But it's not. So x minus 3 is not a factor. So therefore, n this isn't telling you a factor. So this one, this one, this one should be thrown out. Plus, where is this 5 and the 2 and the negative 2 coming from? Yeah, it's, I guess maybe from here or something, but these just make no sense. But really what it's telling you is not only is the remainder negative 2. Yes, the remainder is negative 2, but also when you plug in 3, you get negative 2. That's your function value. Uh, but that's like synonymous with the remainder when you do that synthetic division. OK, next. This is a function a quadratic. This should be the last hard one of this section. And then we're going to get to an easy one. So if you're struggling on this problem, just skip it and go to 31, because 31 through 34 are going to be much easier. So if you're running low on time, don't waste time right there. So now we got x squared minus 2x minus 15. Which of the following is an equivalent form from which the coordinates of the vertex can be identified? Well, this is a very tricky question because they're not saying it, but guess what they're asking for? They're asking for vertex form. So we need to put this into vertex form. Uh, y equals x squared minus 2x minus 15. Okay, The way we do that is we complete the square. X squared minus 2x, take half of this and square it, which half of that is 1, 1 squared is 1, minus 15. But since I'm adding a 1 here, I have to subtract the 1 out here to keep it balanced, make sure we're not fundamentally changing this equation. And then this, be, this can be foiled into x minus 1 squared. Not foiled, factored, excuse me, into that. And then minus 16. So this is my vertex form. This is what we should be looking for. And guess what? This shows me the vertex really nicely, right? Uh, x value of 1, which is right here, pretty much. And a y value of negative 16, which looks right. So that is showing me the vertex. And I think we've done that correctly. So that's another shortcut if they're asking a question like this, which you can see where it is, right? And this is the only one that has 1 and negative 16. Because it's always, it's always x minus h squared plus k. This is vertex form where the center is positive h and k. So the sign here is flipped. The sign here is what it is. Uh, anyways, it's right there. OK, now we'll see a nice reset in difficulty. Why can husk 12 dozen ear corn per hour? Uh, between 12 per hour and 18 per hour. Based on this information, what is a possible amount of time in hours that it could take y to hus 72? OK. Uh, it could be as few as 6 hours, right? 6 times 12 is 72. Uh, it could be as high, uh, it could be as short as 4 hours. 4 times 18 is 72. I'm going to pick a nice number in between. Those. 4 and 6 should both work, but let's just pick uh, 5. I think like you could technically answer 5.5 .5 or anything, and it would all work. But five should be sh should be good, right? 14. Okay. Next, 32. The posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge in Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that's carrying x identical boxes, each weighing 14 pounds, so 14 times x gives us the weight of that, will pass over the bridge if the combined weight 
of the empty deliver truck and its driver, I see what this is going to set up an equation, is 4,500. So look, this is the weight of the truck and the delivery guy. This would be the weight of the boxes. And these two combined have to be less than or equal to this. What is the maximum possible value that X will be keep the combined weight of the truck driver and boxes below the bridges? Okay, so let's solve for X. Actually, it says below, so I don't think it's greater than less than or equal to. It's just less than. So it's 14X is less than. And it says we want a whole number. So this is 6,000 minus 4,500 is 1,500. Divide both sides by 14. X is less than... 107.1 so 107 that's the because that that'd be the whole because we need to go less than this so 107 is that whole number I think number of portable media players sold worldwide according to the line graph above the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of 2011 so 2008 is a hundred. 2011 is 160, simplify, and it's 10 over 16, which is 5 over 8. I think that's it. Yeah. It doesn't even say it needs to be in simplest form. So, hold on, let me just make sure the number is what fraction. Yeah, 100, 160. Okay, good. I think that's right. A local television station sells time slots for programs in 30 minute intervals. If the station operates 24 hours a day, every day of the week, what is the total number of 30 minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? Well, 30 minutes, 24 in one day, so there's two per hour, so 48 in one day. So that's for Tuesday, and then again on Wednesday, we can sell it to 48. So you add those two together, and you get, should get 96. Okay, next. Now these last four might be a little tougher. Dairy farmer uses storage silo, blah, blah, blah. If the volume of the silo is this, what is the diameter? Okay, the formula for the volume <clears throat> of a cylinder is pi r squared, which is the area of a circle times the height, which is 8. And in this case, they're telling us that the volume is 72 pi. Now let's plug in what we know. 72 pi equals pi times, we don't know the radius. We need to solve that to get the diameter. But we do know the height is 8. So now let's isolate for r. We're going to divide both sides by 8 pi. Boom, boom. And this becomes 70, the pi's cancel out. 72 divided by 8 is 9. 9 equals r squared. Therefore, r equals, we take the square root of both sides, r equals 3. But it's not asking for the radius, it's asking for the diameter, which they underline. So it's just double the radius, which is 6. Next. h of x equals this. For what value of x is the function h undefined? Well, the only time when this is undefined is when the denominator goes to 0. So x minus 5 squared plus 4 times x minus 5 plus 4 equals when does this happen so let's solve for x okay we're gonna have to foil everything out combine and then try and factor and solve for zero you could try and plug and chug but this would be really hard to do that and to like guess answers because there's no multiple choice so this foiled out becomes x squared minus 10x okay it's kind of like you can double this value throw it onto x because remember it's x times negative 5 plus x times negative 5 and then plus 25 plus 4x, I'm distributing the 4, minus 20 plus 4 equals 0. Uh, the x squared and then negative 10x plus 4x is negative 6x, 25 minus 20 is 5, plus 4 is 9. I believe this can be factored. Yeah, this is just x minus 3 times x minus 3, uh, which means that x equals 3 for this. So when x equals 3, this is undefined, we can we can actually test it out. 3 minus 5 is negative 2 squared is 4. 3 minus 5 is negative 2 times 4 is negative 8 plus 4. Yeah, and that gives you 0. So 3 is the value. Okay, 
what two part question. Okay, Jessica opened a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. So let's get our form. Oh, her initial deposit was 100. She uses this expression 100 times x to the t to find the value of the account after two years. What is the value of x in the expression? Uh, oh, yeah, so this is, so this is like compounded interest formula. J equals the principal times one plus uh, compounded annually. It's just basically one plus R. R is the percentage of the interest rate, but in decimal format uh, to the T. So in this case, X is this part. And since my interest rate is 2%, R is 0 0.02, right, in decimal format. So 1 plus 0 0.02 means that x should be 1.02 to the t. So it is important to know the formula for com compound interest. They do ask about this pretty regularly now, like one or two questions, like you see here. And then next, we've got Jessica's friend Tyshawn found an account that earns 2.5 interest. So this is Jessica's. Um, Tyshawn is also investing 100, and he's saying 1.25. Okay, after 10 years, how much more money will Tyshawn's initial deposit have earned than Jessica's? So all we have to do is calculate this value and this value for 10 years. So t is 10, right? And then subtract. And that should give us the uh, that should give us the difference. So 100 times 100 times 1.02 to the 10th power equals 1 Wait a minute. Does that sound right? 2 divided by 2 is 30. Yeah, okay, sure. So 121.89, 121.90. And then Tayshawn is, wait, should I not round yet? Yeah, no, uh, let's see, 0.899. Let's keep it as nice and precise as possible. And then this one is okay, 100 times 1.025 to the also 10th power. Like what I'm, I'm always looking at the numbers and I'm trying to do a gut check and make sure does that make sense? Does it make sense to me? 128.008. Your answer, rounding to your answer to the nearest cent. <clears throat> so now it's 128 minus 121.899. So six dollars and eleven cents. Hold on a second, though, because this is a little. I this is a little uh, weird. Let's let's actually because I rounded and, and then I calculated that can potentially throw this off by like a cent or something. So we'll do it a different way. A hundred. You could do this more easily on a scientific calculator times one point oh two to the tenth power minus one hundred times one point oh two five. Oh, I did it backwards, but that's okay. It'll, it'll whatever it'll give us a negative number, and then we just flip the sign. Uh, yes, so it still rounds up to six dollars and eleven, eleven cents. Okay, uh, now I'm cool with that. I, I just did that so that way there's no rounding errors that are possible, especially with something like this that's asking to the nearest cent. We just want to be careful of that. So this is pretty good. Um, let's see. Okay, let's do a quick, so lots of time left, which is, that's, you know, pretty, un, like, when I'm trying to give the explanations, I usually don't end with that much time, <laughs> but uh, it just happened that way, and feel pretty confident about these answers. 2x, what is the value of x equals 5, y equals 24, so it's 4 times 5 is 20, yeah. This one I was really confident about, this one I was pretty confident. 16 plus 4x is 24. 4x equals 8. 8x equals 16. Yes. This one was good. Let's make sure. Yep. 
This one I was good. This one I was very comfortable with. This one I was very comfortable with. Uh, this one definitely good. Yep, I was good with those. This one I was very comfortable too. Yeah, I was good with this one too. And this one as well. Yeah, this is the one that I told you, you just gotta know range is always hit the hardest when you remove an outlier. Yeah, initial cost of renting the boat. Yeah. Negative three for that minimum, correct. This one I was very comfortable with. Because once again, A is positive and B is negative. Yeah, so yes. 650. I think I don't want to do the math again on this one. I remember I was pretty confident on that math. This one I was very confident. Okay, this one I wanted to do again. So we have, so we have, uh, what if a person's chosen random who recalled at least one dream? And again, that's from this section one to four and five or more. That's at least one, both of these groups. What is the probability that the person belonged to group Y? So the total is this plus this, which is 164. Probability is the people from group Y, which is 11 and 68, 79 out of the total universe in that subset, which is 164. And that's what I chose. Okay, so I'm good there. This one I was pretty good. Oh yeah, uh, let's quickly, so education, right? You could see that this one, okay, let's actually do the math here. More specific, precisely, I don't think you need to at all, but let's just, for fun, 4,051 divided by five, nine, two, one, three, seven, nine equals 0.684, okay, so it's about two thirds. And then we chose this as our answer, so 0 0.68, let's say, two, one, let's just round to 1,000, two, one, six, four, divided by 3,008, 0 0.719, so pretty close to 0 0.68. And the other one that I said maybe was this one, but I don't think so, 1468, highways and transportation divided by one seven seven three. No, it's too high. The other one's closer, closer to point six eight. So we're good there. I was pretty confident on this one. I was pretty confident because we did that distance formula. We got five thirds. It has to be this. It has to yeah. Circle equation. You got to memorize that one. But like I said, use my song, and it will uh, make life a lot easier. Uh, this one, I calculated five seconds. Yeah, it's definitely right. This one I was pretty good, comfortable with. This one I was very comfortable with. Very comfortable with this one. Yep. And this one I was pretty good with too. Yes. I think so. 160, 2008, 100 over 160, 10 over 16, 5 over 8, yeah. Okay, 30 minute intervals, the station offers 24 hours per day, so that's 48. Tuesday and Wednesday, 48, 48, 96. Diameter of 6, 9, 3, 6, yeah. This one was good. I checked it. I remember I double checked the math by plugging in three. Okay, I think we're good. Let's see what we got. Do, do, do. All right, let's review it. Boom, 38, all correct. And that's it for today, my friends. Let's go to the questions now. All righty. Mason, is FOIL the same thing as box method? Um, the box method that I'm familiar with, it it's what you use for, for FOILing, specifically when you have a coefficient in front of the first term. And 
you don't really you usually don't need it if there's no coefficient you can kind of usually do it mentally but yes box method is definitely there's another thing called the star method which is pretty good too uh, for foiling when there's a coefficient, but usually they don't do they usually don't do that to you on the SAT to make it too difficult But I'm sure they're in the week like if there is one of the problems and you'll see how I how I tackle But usually they don't make them that hard Madison, do you think the Khan Academy questions? Yes, I think they, they are the best representation So like I told you guys I took the real deal in 2016 I'm gonna take it again this year as well to, to stay up on the test, but I got an 800 when I took it in 2016. Khan Academy are the best, and there's a reason for that. Khan Academy has actually formed an official partnership with the College Board, so they have access to authentic, real uh, questions from the College Board, who are the makers of the SAT. And in fact, uh, even when they, so I saw a talk given by somebody who works at the College Board, even what happened is even as Khan Academy continued to write additional practice problems, they do so under the guidance of the College Board. And so this is awesome. You know, you look at Princeton Review, Kaplan, these other test prep companies, and I mean, look, Kaplan, uh, Khan Academy, everything is free and it's the best. They are the best questions. I even have a video course. I, I put a link for it in the description. You can check that out. I have 700 additional practice problems, but I'll be honest with you. The Khan Academy ones are better than mine. The reason why I created this video course is to give you additional practice beyond Khan Academy, and of course, it's got my video explanations. But really, if you're if you're looking for good practice problems this week and you haven't done all the Khan Academy practice problems, hit those. Those are the best. Uh, no, are these going to are these going? Yes, this will be on the channel when the stream is done for sure. Uh, will you ever do? No, I'm not going to do the reading and writing section. Um, yeah, I it would be great. So like when I took it, obviously I'm an adult, you know, I've, I'm an attorney. I've been through law school, right? So I like obviously I could do like I got a 740 on the verbal without, you know, without I don't really have to do much like that's how it is for most adults. But I'm I can't like I don't feel like I'm an expert at teaching how to approach those sections. I can just kind of do it cuz I can read fairly fast and stuff like that, but that's just not my expertise. You know what I can do though? is I can look for some really awesome tutors in the Los Angeles area that are masters of the verbal part and maybe bring them on one day and have them kind of do a, do a joint session with me. But anyways, that was it. And then Ricky, I see that you're saying this is so neat. I'm so glad uh, you think so. I really hope this was helpful. So look, guys, bottom line is I hope you gleaned as much as you could out of watching me take the test in real time. Again, if you want to check out my video course, just click on the link below. There's like a massive discount for anybody watching this if you if you use that link and you want to uh, prep with my video course. Again, learn the math. Spend this time during this week focusing on doing practice problems and, and understanding whatever math concepts are tricky or confusing for you. Post additional questions in the description, in the uh, comment section below. And by the way, if you found this helpful, please click that subscribe button and like the video if you especially liked it and found it useful. Now, we're gonna be doing this every day this week at 10.30, so same time frame, roughly 10.30 to 12. And on Friday, I'm gonna go through also some hard-hitting tips that you can remember to employ the day on, on the day of, to just give you, uh, to just kinda help to increase your speed and accuracy when it counts. All right, so thank you guys so much, and I'll see you all next time. Take it easy.